back again talking about Romans chapter 8 this time. The golden triangle we'll talk mm. about. We'll find out what makes it so golden. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> um, Dave is here, Chase, mm-hmm. Mike, and myself. Uh, the first question before we get into the passage is we want to talk a little bit about the context in which we hear these sermons every week. Mm. And usually there is singing. Most people, I mean, people probably sing in their car throughout their week, but it's very rare that people show up and sing with a big group of people. Mm -hmm. And people probably even feel a little self-conscious about the way they sing or the way that their voice sounds. So talk a little bit about how the singing specifically complements and feeds the preaching. Uh, Before I... Before I even answer that question, you reminded me, I've been looking to get a good deal on uh, buying a piano. If any of you guys know a dealer, <laughs> if anybody knows a dealer looking for a, rip, by the a way, rip-off kind of a deal. Which, by the way, I it love. Was, yeah, it was 50 bucks, not 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the way, I don't know who I told this, one of you guys, but my brother is like a professional yard sale guy, basically, Wesley. He like finds stuff and then sells it. And he was like, dude, why didn't you tell me? I would have bought the piano. <laughs> he said, I would have bought it and sold it. You know it. this is my thing. <laughs> I was like, Wesley, I didn't even think about you. Oh, that was hilarious that uh, you said that that's afterwards. That's so funny. But anyways, uh, great. One, one quick thought that I would have, there's so much that could be said there, is that um, everything that we do together, we want to do in accordance with what Jesus invites us into. Um, and we, we talk about renewing our hearts and minds, reorienting our hearts. We, we use those phrases a lot. It's basically we want to remind ourselves of uh, what story we're living in. Mm. And, you know, it's like every, every sermon is in some sense incomplete because it can only say so much about the whole story. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so we try to tell the story on the front end each week. Most Sundays, what you'll find at our church is a vertical song of adoration and thanksgiving and praise, some kind of song that you know involves the story of Jesus, life, death, resurrection, ascension, promise, return, and then some kind of like prayer and supplication of how I'm flushing this out in our daily life. Um, and so it, it again, it, it takes different shapes and forms each each week. This week we started with who you say am as opposed to a big vertical adoration, thanksgiving, mm-hmm. praise song, in part because it was connected to Romans 8, um, what Chase was going to be preaching on, and because we had baptisms in 945 and 115. So it was just a, a great way. You're, you're almost like demonstrating the story in the act of baptism, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then we sang about the fruit of now I'm in Christ, and so I am who the Lord says mm-hmm. I am. But... That's great. We'll keep going. What else did we do? You are going to go through it, I thought. Yeah, keep going. What are the other songs we sang? We'll do songs of confession. Mm-hmm. Song. Well, we sang Sunday. Who oh, was oh, it? oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I'm sorry. Specific to the Sunday. The second song we sang is Jesus' Firm Foundation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is just an old hymn. It's a little bit of a new take on it, but that's, you know, the Christ is our rock, our refuge. It's like a on Christ is solid rock, I stand. It's a similar hymn to that. Mm-hmm. It gets into the story as well, but it's basically a great way for people who are coming in and all of the chaos of this world to remind themselves of the unwavering rock and assurance of Jesus mm-hmm. and what he's accomplished for us. And then we finish with a prayer uh, straight from you know Psalm 119 as Ephesians and Colossians that encourages us to sing together, um, just that the Lord would renew our lives and lead us down his ways, his commandments, his paths, so that we would walk in obedience. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think the importance of singing um, as one, you know, who's not even very musically talented, um, is, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's too strong to say it can't be overstated. Maybe it could be overstated, but I think it's very important, um, just as a human being. I mean, human beings love to sing. We love music, um, concerts, you know, all different kind of cultures all, all have music. So to be human is to engage with music. And so for the Lord to use that, as that tool and that gift to renew us is valuable in the context of hearing a sermon because singing is designed to engage me holistically. Yep. Um, my mind is being engaged with the lyrics. Yep. My um, body is being engaged with the rhythm. 
you mm-hmm. know, whether again, whether we're super rhythmic or not, like, mm-hmm. you know, the music is connecting to the body. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the emotions are involved in the over the, the interplay between those two things for sure. And so singing is calling me into this holistic moment, mm-hmm. which is what I think discipleship is. It's discipleship is all of me being, you know, um, loving the Lord, my God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and music is a very powerful tool to do that. So to do that every week, I think, is very important. Even in the Discover New City class on Sunday, you were asked a "Would you rather" question. Would you mm-hmm. rather mm-hmm. Um, only be able to watch movies, or yeah, or, or only be able to listen to music? Only yeah. be able to listen to music, and yeah. you chose to get rid of movies, kind of for just because I think of the power. I mean, the power of story too. I wouldn't if you had asked me to get rid of story or get rid of songs. I'd be like, oh man, I don't know if I could do either. I couldn't live without either. I, you know, I wouldn't have anything to sing about. But you can tell a story in a song. Yeah, there you go. So I think that's um, yeah. I just think that's a great question, and I think it's important and. I would encourage people who don't normally sing to start moving their mouth a little bit and then to start muttering the words and then just see where it goes from there. Super practically. I mean, imagine yourself just showing up to church this coming Sunday. We say good morning, and then all of a sudden Mike starts preaching. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you would prob- everybody would probably feel, and again, this is somewhat what we're used to in the way right. that it's been laid out, but but it's also part like, you know, you might be thinking, whew, I need to kind of, I don't know that I'm ready to hear like all of it yet. You know what I mean? I'd like to, I'd like to get there, so to speak. And yeah. so um, it does help us. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, it prepares us to hear the word and it's just all part of like the same package yeah, <laughs> of us gathering is. together. And so should people be thinking of it more like, um, you know, oh boy, the, like those people are leading me to sing or those people as opposed to those people are playing for me to listen to up there, right? I mean, I mean the, the idea is that we're all singing and joining our voices um, no mm-hmm. matter what you sound like, as you often make that, <laughs> you often make that joke. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, part well, of part well, of the sermon is 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 singing. Yeah, and or hearing it, the sermon is. Yeah, for sure. The whole the whole reason the band is playing is to help us all mm-hmm. to gather us all. You know, you know, we're not just all like shouting out our own <laughs> things. Right. So yeah, for sure. So in Romans eight. Uh, we can do a little bit of recap, but just beginning with a question, we talk a lot about mindset. That mm-hmm. was one of your main um, um, application points at the end. You know, you gave us the acronym Chase made. Mm-hmm. You know, the first M would be mindset. Tell yourself what's real, which I thought mm-hmm. was really, we thought was a really great way to just summarize what we even mean by mindset. Mm-hmm. Uh, early in the passage, you know, in verse five, those who live according to the flesh have minds that are set on what the flesh desires. And so talk a lot about the mindset that is set on Christ. What does it mean to have a mindset that is set on the flesh? I think a big part of this, one of the reasons I want to talk about this in Sermon Plus was because I think we, again, we, and this isn't anyone's fault necessarily, but we, we tend to get categories. We can only process so much information at once, and, but then to hear things again and broaden our categories is helpful. When you think about the mindset of the flesh, that's not just like, uh, you know, inappropriate sexual desire, mm-hmm. you know, or like what we would consider, quote unquote, blatant greed, mm-hmm. you know, like the mindset on the flesh is a mindset of self-confidence in who I am or what I have accomplished apart from Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. That really is the mindset of the flesh. And so if you go back to chapter 3, when he talks about, well, what, what's the result of justification as a gift received through faith? Well, the result of that is that we don't boast in our accomplishments. We don't boast in the law. We don't boast in our flesh. And so Paul's obviously not saying there, he's not, he's not saying, yeah, you guys are boasting in your inappropriate you know, greed or sexual desires. No, he's saying boasting in the flesh means you have a mindset that basically I'm approved before God or I'm good. You know, I, I just think in colloquial terms, like I'm good, you know, I'm fine because of anything, literally anything other than the work of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit indwelling within me. And so I think when that becomes the case, it's like we recognize that the the breadth of what we're seeking to renew our minds in is pretty broad, actually. 
and um, you know it's going to be important for us. And we've stressed this already that progress and process, working through the struggle because it is a big deal. We're, we, we're so accustomed. I like what you said, Chase, about the automatic. We've mm-hmm. been we've 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 been we've grown accustomed just by living in this world and mm-hmm. having to learn to either rely on ourselves or rely on other people or whatever. We've just kind of automatically do those type of things, and it's like no, those automated responses are most likely tied to a fleshly mindset and they need to be put off and then replaced with new responses. And so hence the mindset of the spirit, which you talked about. And actually, I assume we'll talk about next week as well. So a mindset on the flesh would include obviously greed, obviously inappropriate sexual desires, but it could also, you know, be this kind of self-sufficient, I'm good mentality. It can be that, well, I've been to church my whole life mentality, so I'm really fine. Or I'm a really hard worker, and so therefore, you know, don't challenge me. Like, it, 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 there's all kinds of ways that we just have human responses or the human perspective on who we are, what we've accomplished. That's the mindset on the flesh. And Paul's saying, you know, that type of mindset actually is not leading to new life in Christ Jesus and forevermore. Which is why he says in verse 8 that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Because the pleasing, I think that language of pleasing is like doing something to like curry favor Mm -hmm. with God. And I also think that goes to the Jewish and Gentile audience who were were probably bickering or for sure were bickering at least with like, we're the Jews. Yeah. So like we have a right to this because of our flesh, Mm -hmm. literally. And then the Gentiles are kind of like, well, you know better than we are. We're just kind of doing whatever. So it's like. Exactly. And their flesh. Exactly. Again, was not inappropriate, greedy desires. It was my Jewish heritage exactly. and my, you know, at least superficial keeping of the law, quote unquote. Exactly. Like, and so Paul was saying, no, that needs to be abandoned. That's the old way. Yes. We're under the new way now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, that stuff runs deep, by the way. And it doesn't, you know, you'll be, you will be putting off a f- fleshly, quote unquote, mindset the entire time that you have brought this fleshly mindset into your life in Christ. <laughs> And so some of those things run pretty deep, and they can be pretty deceptive and hard to hard to confront at times, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you talked in there a little bit about, you know, like we can please God in the Spirit, like as we're in the Spirit. Mm-hmm. I know sometimes, you know, this this idea of God being happy with us or us pleasing God gets um, wrapped up into... Like, what can we do to earn favor with God, kind Mm -hmm. of as you just said there. And so I think, you know, we can kind of fall off on on maybe either side where, um, you know, we are kind of overconfident, you know, the mind that's set on the flesh, thinking that we can do a lot of things in which God will be impressed and offer us his favor. And then maybe on the other side of the canyon or in the other on the other side of the street would be, um, you know, we're uh, we're recognizing our union with Christ, and but we still kind of think that God is angry with us all the time, and so or at can, least moderately disappointed. Yeah, right. And like <laughs> mm-hmm. you just kind of keeping us around because he feels like he has to, or something like that. You know what I mean? And so, just basically, as I'm thinking about my relationship with God, can I do things that bring joy to God? <laughs> You know, should I be thinking of God that way? Like, as I obey, he is happy with me? One of my, it's more than this. You know, that's a, that's a pretty complex question because the nitty gritty is like when it comes to the Bible, you know, a, a command from the Lord is don't do this. Mm-hmm. And if you do it, that very act displeases the Lord. And there, there is a sense in which, you know, you're, you're committing sin against a person, you know, not just like breaking some moral code. And so there's, there's a... Uh, there's a displeasure there for sure, and and even you know that's where consequences you know come in in, in Christ, not punishment, but but consequences. However, I think the the maybe the bigger way that I view the pleasing God and displeasing God is more about how um, the Father desires my good for me, and for me to li- live in that blessedness, and so He gives me instructions and principles and precepts and statutes to live according to because he knows it will be for my good and I will enjoy his goodness and I'll see his love and care for me and his wisdom and his provision within there. And and so it's it's less like 
um, you know, we're so transactional as humans. It's like, hey, Chase, can you can you go to Safeway really quick and grab me a Starbucks? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, now I'm displeased. You know what I mean? Be- because I'm just, it's like this big, big selfish thing. I'm as opposed to, you know. Chase, would you go pick up something from Safeway for me? And inside the grocery bag, I've like stuck a week's worth of groceries for free for him. And I'm like, no, I want you to go. Will you go? And he's like, no, I would be displeased because I'm like, oh, he's going to miss out on something that I really have for him, that mm-hmm. I love him. And that, that's like, you, you even think of like children. It's like mm-hmm. um, when my son acts up, I, I, I have to fight against this in my flesh, but I'm, I'm primarily discouraged when he acts a certain way because I'm like, oh no, son, you don't want to live that way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's so much better for you. And it's not primarily about me. Uh, it's primarily about him. So the, the pleasing God and displeasing God thing for me is actually, I think, a, a nod to how much the Father really loves us. And so he gives us these instructions so that we can enjoy to the max amount his goodness that is within his like ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the... That's in a sense the flip side of the question. Yes, the, it totally is. Can we displease God? And I think that's a wonderful answer, by the way. Affirm that and amen. Can we please him in Christ Jesus? I think the answer to that is yes. Mm-hmm. I think that's what he's saying. I, I think because of the, again, we need to go back. We need to hold these two realities together, the status that we have of justification in Christ Jesus and the incorporation by the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. into Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because of the status I now have in Christ Jesus, it's like I was there on Jesus' baptism day. Mm. Uh, I just wrote a letter to my daughter about this. Parenting is seen on baptism day with Jesus. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. Belonging, loving, and pleasure. And now that I'm in Christ, the Father says over to me, status, mm-hmm. status-wise, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And so that's the status I live out of. And therefore, the displeasure, everything you said makes perfect sense. Once I've got that status, right. there, there's no more displeasure of fear of being cast out. Exactly. It's, it's fear of missing out, really. E- exactly. Uh, uh, and during this time frame that we're, in which we live. And then the flip side of that is like when I do walk in obedience, it does bring the Father great pleasure. It's a, you know, the Hebrews 13 talks about that, a sacrifice of praise. You know, that the Lord is honored by that. He rejoices in that. He delights in that. And again, the, the metaphor of sonship is going to be big here. It's coming up week in chapter 8. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we need to, you said this I th- when, last time you preached, Dave, this, this whole idea of I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Like Christians should not think like that, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's nuance. It's kind of a yes and no. Like we, we, we don't ever forget who we were outside of Christ. Yes and amen. But we, we have to have a distinctive break like, well, that is not primarily how God talks to us anymore. Even the Corinthian church, which they were a mess, right? And all of God's people said, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're a mess. Mm-hmm. And yet he calls them saints in chapter one. So um, so I think for those of us that are in Christ Jesus, we really need to embrace, um, and, and it's very motivating. It's actually very motivating to think, oh, I can please God. It's very demotivating to think, well, no matter what I do, God will always just look at it as kind of subpar and apart from his grace. I'd never be able to do it anyway. You know, like that that whole line of reasoning, I think, is kind of more of a fleshly mindset, honestly. I think a spirit-set mindset is, no, now I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm, he empowered me to do this very thing. He's actually given me a will to that I can now exercise with him. So, yeah. Anyway, I think the answer to that question is yes. And I think Christians should be encouraged and motivated to be even more pleasing to him uh, every single day of their lives because they can because that's possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how unmotivating it would be to live a life where it's like, well, you could never please him. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and even third, John, you know, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, well, where, do, where does that kind of heart and concept come from? It comes from our Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's truth that sets us free. It's truth that liberates us. It, it recognizes who we are in Christ. All the It's the access to all the inheritance that we have in Jesus. It's yeah. yeah. Motivation in this does matter, by the way, because to please God, we do have to operate out of faith. Yeah. We have to operate out of that fundamental justification, as I said. You know, so there is that reality. So we're not pleasing God by do, two people could do the same exact act, come and sing at church, let's say, and the heart does matter. It does. One can do it out of faith and one can do it out of the flesh. 
and one is pleasing to God and one is not. And so, you know, I, I do think those motivations matter. And so we do need to think thoroughly about how we are pleasing God. But being united with Christ and walking in the spirit, which is a walk of faith, is a means, is a kind of recipe, if we want to use that metaphor, Amen. for pleasing the Lord, for sure. But in Christ, if, if we are in Christ, the displeasure from our, from our Father is an invitation. It's, it's like a, it's not a, you know, with, with Isaiah, the warning was basically, get out of my face, I'm not even listening to you because there's blood in your hands, your heart's far from, from, from me. Yeah. And, and the idea there is that it's like, these people don't even know who the Father is. An, but in, in New Covenant language, it's like, um, you know, the, the command in James chapter 3, where it's like from the same tongue comes cursing and blessing, my brothers, this should not be. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing as Isaiah 1. But then it goes into James 4 where it's like, so resist the devil, so make yourself God, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so the displeasure, for example, uh, with, a, with a person on Sunday morning who comes and one heart is full of faith, one heart is just like, um, you know, maybe there's hypocrisy, maybe there's like serious sin. If that person is in Christ, the Father is not displeased and then going, get out of my sight. Right, mm-hmm. right. He, he's, he's, he's actually saying, you know, Let's clean this up. You know what I mean? Like he's he's offering life and hope. It's an invitation to, to. Well, you mentioned the new covenant. Like think about what should happen at the Lord's Supper. It's an invitation to dinner, even for the quote unquote hypocrite. Mm-hmm. And then he says, "Examine yourselves and then participate." Right. It's not examine yourself and then don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's right. examine yourself to participate. So yeah, that is the new covenant. And, and today it's like you know th- this is helpful language, like because it's like um. You know, if if you are working in a job and you find out your boss calls you in the office because he's displeased with your work, mm-hmm. you're worried you're going to get fired, mm-hmm. you know, you, or, or or something like that. And that's that's not like how the again. I love that you mentioned Romans eight begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. Mm-hmm. And so we're we're in the family. Nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. And we're in Christ. We have this Holy Spirit. It's more like, no, I have so much more for you that I want you to experience life in in the Spirit, which brings peace and kills sin and death. And so it's it's just an invitation. In. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking about God that way, you're actually thinking about the law. That's what you're actually thinking yeah, about. Yeah, right? uh, that's exactly right. How can I please him in the sense of keeping the commands, that's yeah. literally what Paul says you're that's free exactly from right. in mm-hmm. the law. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're not, you know, you know, he says, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. So now we serve in the new way of the spirit, which is not a result of performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, almost like the um, the caricature of like the, the older person that is like stoically looking on things and it's like, this pleases me. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like you don't get the sense that that person's actually happy, mm-hmm. but whatever the situation is, it has cleared his standard of being acceptable to him. And while it is that, but that's just the law, mm-hmm. there does seem to be passages and, and things that, that highlight, you know, God actually caring and actually being happy, you know, you, you know, maybe not mm. when you use happy, but like happy can seem like kind of a, a trite and simplistic thing to apply to God, but it seems it seems to be true. The emotion of happiness and joy that he can feel toward his children. So I was, you know, I was encouraged by that, you know, just to kind of think through that on Sunday. You know, the fact that that as we live uh in the spirit, you know, God is happy, which mm. is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mike. Uh, this is a very big conversation we're having right now. Like this is, you know, this is the kind of stuff where if, if this really drops in your heart and your mind consistently, yeah. this is the kind of stuff that really does, in fact, make you new. And th- and that's a hard, you know, Romans 8 is going to end this way. If God is for you, I, I think that's another way of thinking about yeah. is God happy or pleased with me? It's like. He well. Let me go maybe a, a little deeper than is God happy with me? Is God for me? He is always mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. And when He's displeased with me, it's as you've described exactly. Dave very well. He He's always for me. He will always be for me. And you know, as my holiness and sanctification, obedience, which is fueled by my faith in the love of Christ and the good news of the gospel, as that catches up with God's desires for me. I am happy, and he, and he is. There's there's a greater degree of pleasure uh, that he finds because he's bringing his work to completion. Mm-hmm. He he never he did not 
justify us in order to leave us justified sinners. He has justified us in order to glorify us. And that process is, you know, it, that was according to his good pleasure. This pleases him for us to grow in those ways. So 100%. Um, and I will say this, it, it can be pretty challenging, you know, when, you know, we all have done things that we feel ashamed of. To go back to this idea of shame you mentioned, mm-hmm. Chase, in your sermon, no condemnation. And when those things resurface, even if they're old, man, it can feel very debilitating. Yep. Man. And you just want to be like, Ugh, I don't even know if I really want to do much of anything for the Lord or why? what is even worth it? Like, I've got this black mark against me. Mm-hmm. And again, that's where mindset of spirit or mindset of flesh. The flesh is just like, well, forget it. Who cares? It's like, mm-hmm. what am, you know, I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. If people really knew anyway, like, this is pointless. That is a mindset on the flesh. The mindset of the spirit is actually, sure. you know, it's as, as hopeful as it's challenging. You'd be like, well, no, that's actually done away with. And you can actually get up, mm-hmm. dust yourself off, quote, unquote, by the Holy Spirit. Or if you want to use John 15, he dusts us off. He dusts our feet off. And we can go again. Mm-hmm. That actually is a mindset on the spirit. Of mm-hmm. that, of like, okay, hey, I'm up, I'm going. Like, I don't have to dwell on that shame. And even if people around you are dwelling in that shame on you, they're you know they're pointing the finger and they're saying shame on you. The mindset of the spirit isn't to give in to them. The mindset of the spirit is to say, well, you can shame me all you want, but if God is for me, who could be against me? The devil brings a charge against me. He can't even do it. It's God who justifies. And so, like, I am justified, and so I will move forward in Christ likeness, regardless of what. I think about me, what the devil says about me, the Zechariah reference, Zechariah 3 was great, or what other Christians might even say about me. Mm-hmm. I am justified. And that's a mindset on the spirit. Mm-hmm. E- even what's true about me. Yeah. I mean, that's the who could bring a charge against God's elect. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, the answer is actually a lot of people can, including myself. <laughs> you know, no, seriously. Yeah. I'll tell you. Th- that's, yeah. that's not yeah. the point of Romans. Right. The point of Romans 8 in that, in that, that you know, a rhetorical question is not to say there are no charges yeah, against you. Or to prove it's, your innocence. It's yeah, to right. say the charges have been dropped. They've been yeah. dealt mm-hmm. with. They've been paid for. Mm-hmm. It's like pick anything that you feel shame of from your past and be like, well, this is the charge against me. And it's like Jesus knew Romans 5 in love. He went to the cross for it, paid the debt. Now how much more that you belong to him and are a son or daughter, will he not care for you and keep Amen. you to the end? It's too good. Yeah, that's so great. And he promised that he would with the life of his own son. Yeah. Yeah. He said, if he, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how we not also with him graciously give us all things? Yeah. I, I love that, you know, that paid for language too. It's so liberating. He, like Romans 6, he exhausted mm-hmm. the sentencing. It's, if someone right. came to me and said, <laughs> you're guilty, but the charges were dropped, which you said, which they are, but they're dropped not because they were dismissed. Right. Some swept under the rug They or were something. dropped because they were paid for. Right, exactly. That is like in your face to the accuser. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like mm-hmm. whoever that's like, no, that not only did that happen, but that has been exhausted is like, wow, that is very liberating. And so, you know, and, and again, it, it takes, this is the, the Jesus consciousness, why we keep talking about the importance of mindset, because I mean, I've experienced this even in the last couple of weeks of just like, mm-hmm. man, these this is like, uh, that's just so such a bummer about some things, that, things I've done, but it's like, okay, Jesus actually says no condemnation, and mm-hmm. we can actually move forward, and he doesn't see me that way, so praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, you brought up that golden triangle of spiritual growth, mm-hmm. which I think, d- does anybody... Can, bef- before we go to that... Yeah, go ahead. Because this is a little bit of a piggyback off the God being pleased or, or mm-hmm. the displeased language. Um, uh, I can we talk about your in your application you made you know being made new I was made for this you talked about mindset abstaining delighting and engaging mm-hmm. by the way I thought uh, just personally speaking I thought that those four little like one liners after that were very very helpful yes I told Dan it's like my favorite explanation actually of mindset tell yourself what's real mm-hmm. we could do a whole thing talking about that it's really yeah. outstanding but point three was delight and the, and the one line I was think on the goodness of God, and I wanted to press into that even a little bit more, mm-hmm. because what God has given us the ability to do in the Spirit is to all of a sudden experience and interact in the actual goodness of God and His joy, mm-hmm. that which will you know the in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy, and so we'll know that completely one day. But we have access to it now. Mm-hmm. 
um, you know, again, we, we've said this even this morning, it, it's possible now for me to live in the joy of my Father, in the goodness of God. And so I was just thinking, well, what, are, what are real pra- practical ways, other than just like thinking on the goodness like of God? Like live into bit, the goodness how of do, God? Yeah, how do I enter into it? Mm-hmm. And um, there are several ways, but, but one of the, and this is going to seem maybe not sufficient, and it just might be like the key to unlocking the whole thing. For me, I've been asking the Lord the last two days, how do I live into that goodness? And the thing that keeps coming back to me is thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Gratitude. Mm-hmm. It's like the goodness of God stands up against the quote unquote, you know, badness of the world and me. Mm-hmm. And he's given me so much. Um, and all that I have is from him. And I didn't earn any of it. And so even if you... And it's easy as Americans, you know, to step into this. But even if you are a, a Christian, in, compared to others in this world, with the worst amount of suffering and trial right now, there are still even things to be thankful for. The mm-hmm. goodness of God is present with you, um, and I, I, it's just like this is one of the reasons why in Philippians two, when Paul says that we ought to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, one of the first things he says is, you know, do away with grumbling and complaining. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. to enter into the goodness of God, to delight in God, you have, you have to like rid yourself of grumbling and complaining. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also think that goes a little bit to the abstaining. So there's obviously overlap with all of those. But I think in order for you to really delight in God, you need to abstain from other things that, you th- that are like holding you up in mm. your delight. Does Numbing that make sense? you, false delights. So I think like when Paul, says, delights, yeah. like when Paul says, you know, I've learned the secret to being facing abundance or, mm-hmm. um, you know. Lack or abundance. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's like because when he had lack or when he had nothing, he was able to find satisfaction in God mm-hmm. beyond the things that he had. And so if we train ourselves to be content with nothing, hence abstaining from things, then when we actually, when, and if it comes to where we don't have anything, we're going to be like, oh, yeah. I've trained for this. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm satisfied and content with nothing. Mm. And so I think Dallas Willard even said one one things in that Divine Conspiracy book, which is where I got that triangle from. Um, he talks about like one of the good like an art of being a Christian is being able being satisfied with nothing. Mm-hmm. Which you know obviously you don't have actually nothing. You have God, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like no physical material things, and being able to train yourself mm-hmm. to enjoy those. Yeah. To kind of jump back to what David said about the Thanksgiving piece, mm-hmm. I think the um, that to me really helps clarify the difference between the mindset and the delighting. Because mm-hmm. I did have a question about the, is that kind of overlapping or mm-hmm. what? But like telling myself what is real is not the same thing, although it's right next door. It is to Thanksgiving. <laughs> it is right <laughs> next door <laughs> because of the gospel. Mm-hmm. The gospel. Um, and so I think delighting in God, that's a really important, obviously it's Thanksgiving week next week, so that's mm-hmm. even better. A cultural reinforcement of a biblical reality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the practice of Thanksgiving, um, and again, instead of, you know, we say things all the time, taking things for granted, acting entitled, like we definitely need to avoid that in our Christian experience. Hence why all the Psalms are saying, not all of them, but so many of them are saying, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks because... You know, that is a means of actually delighting in God. It brings that to conclusion. Um, Yeah, I mean, like classic lists of um, practices, you know, a lot of them will include um, gratitude and celebration. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. And so, you know, which are which are not things that would be foreign to the life of the believer, but mm-hmm. but I don't know that we tend to think of them as like, practices like like regularly i pray regularly i fast regularly i take in the scripture regularly i open my mouth and give thanks regularly i open my mouth to celebrate something that's good you know what i mean it's Mm -hmm. like is it is it kind of like not necessarily on that level like there's some sort of uh, competition between these practices but like is that something that is marked out in my calendar in my schedule in my rule of life like I'm going to open my mouth and be thankful for things. I'm going to open my mouth and celebrate things that are that are good. You know, because you look at like historic lists, it's 
you know, people were careful not to forget mm. those things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the, the cultural ripoff of this is negative and positive energy. Mm-hmm. Good vibes. Good vibes, yeah. Like that's the, that's the world's way of talking about this reality. It, because you're talking about complaining I just think of like a staff or, you know, because, you know, I work here in New City and we have a team that we work with or like an actual sports team. And if people start complaining about oh. the coach or the, oh boy. or maybe even their own performance, which is just a way of drawing attention to themselves, or there's so many ways that uh, you can just kind of bring the group down mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. and that's negative energy and it's all complaining. And then like, what turns that around? It's like, well, someone needs to identify something good or positive and then celebrate it, be mm-hmm. thankful for it. And you can, you know, literally change totally just on a human level, yep. like just on yep. a human level, yep. apart from God, you can, I shouldn't even say apart from God, because we can't even breathe apart from God, but like apart from like explicitly acknowledging God, let's put it that way. Um, you can change the dynamics of a group simply by ad- adapting that mindset. And then, you know, the real payoff is when, okay, you get a whole group of people oh, man. that are like, abstaining from focusing on the negative, mm-hmm. which not being naive, not, you know, we're not you're not wishing it away, acting like it's not there, but in the midst of it to say, well, there's there are good things to find here, and the good that we find is more powerful than the bad that we don't, that is hurting us, and then we're going to lock in on that, and we're going to thanks, and we're going to praise. It's like, okay, now, 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 you're, now you're cooking with gas, mm-hmm. so to speak. So, yeah, okay. that's really good. But I think that, that helped me, Dave, as well, from sermon to, to kind of distinguish between mindset and delight. It's helpful. Which yeah. is a perfect transition then to um, the golden triangle yeah, because of the gold uh, part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know. Yeah, I, one of you said that there I was know, a reason why it's golden. Yeah, there we, is. we probably should have looked this up. Prior to the, does anyone know that? Uh, but I, I think it's. I looked it up. It's like a math term, right? Like, and it's it's an isosceles yeah. triangle, yeah. and so the role of the Holy Spirit being like highlighted, correct, supreme right, in this. right, yes. Which yeah. Is yeah. So make a lot of sense. It's Which is why the the, the the graphic of the triangle that he has in the book is, is not what a golden <laughs> triangle. It's not the right size. It can be. I actually saw it on Google. It can be like that, or it can have a wider base that you're like you're thinking okay. of. Okay. But the two the two things on the bottom. <laughs> Are more parallel, and right. the pinnacle is distinct and unique. Yep. Yeah. A bunch so, of M divs talking about mathematics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you take the cosine, <laughs> <laughs> but you have the action of the Holy Spirit, you which have, is essential, obviously. You have ordinary events the of fu- life. He's the fulcrum of the triangle. Yeah, there you go. Mm. And you know, ordinary events what and planned fulcrum. discipline to put on a new uh, heart. to put on a new heart, and so. Um, you talked about planned dis- yep, discipline. I, I That's the engage. On the, on the right side. And we, we talked about that. We've been talking about that. I wanted to just briefly at least touch on Definitely. the ordinary events of life, temptations, mm-hmm. and then incorporate that into mindset, which is which is why Dave said it's a perfect segue. Mm-hmm. Because People talk about that being like passive formation. Yes, passive formation, but don't think passive formation is... Everyone hates the word passive. It has a role. I know. I like it. But it has such a negative connotation. If if someone were to call no, me passive, break out of it. Don't. don't. <laughs> if someone says I was passive, I would be like, Oh yeah, watch how passive I can be. You should be more <laughs> passive about that. <laughs> so yeah, passive formation is good, but it's also, you know, the idea that Jesus' spirit is is doing work in you, in the regular humdrum yes the regular patterns ordinary of events conversation with your friends or conversation with your family or mm-hmm. your job your marriage uh, whatever all those things that are right re- and we're not even talking about like you know massive trials right, right. now we're exactly. just talking about living life basically christy as knuckles as calls it yeah it, as you're listening to this right now you're doing something ordinary yeah mm-hmm. christy knuckles calls it the glorious mundane there you go yeah. yep the glorious mm-hmm. mundane so that uh i remember paul tripp saying if, if god only worked in your life in the one areas that weren't mundane he wouldn't be working very much because our lives are pretty mundane <laughs> right <laughs> exactly so so that's uh, a lie of social media by the way yeah yeah <laughs> you're just posting your whatever yeah, anyways yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly so anyway I, I just wanted to highlight that for us yeah. to recognize and to be thankful even yes. for that that like in the regular rhythms of life which will have maybe 
you know, micro or macro temptations, but a lot of temptations you might face through the day, like as you're saying no in those little ways, wins. Praise the Lord, you Mm -hmm. know, he's doing something. Um, And then obviously when the trials come, that's also part of that lower left corner of that triangle. Those are also massive ways, you know. uh, I was talking with Dave recently about some things he's been working through, and he's like, well, I don't want to be different. Um, after this significant thing happens to me, it's like, well, that's not possible. Right. <laughs> You're going to be different. When, when significant things happen to you, the nature of those significant things is they're going to change you. Mm-hmm. Now, when you adopt the mindset of the Spirit, they're going to change you for the so much better, so much good. Mm-hmm. And if you're in Christ and you kind of adopt a fleshly mindset, they're going to kind of set you back. doesn't mean God's not still for you. doesn't mean he can't take you from there and go a different route. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, that could be a setback. But I can just hear Rudy. Don't let a setback, or no? For every yeah, for every setback, God's got to come. Back. God's got to come back. There we go. Well, the the, so. uh, the ordinary events is the piano illustration too. Yeah, it's just exactly. an ordinary thing. You, uh-huh. I'm selling something in my house that's very ordinary, <laughs> yeah. but it. You know, <laughs> I think they should Holy have Spirit a, used it to really grow me. Have a picture of a garage sale <laughs> next to ordinary. <laughs> I can't imagine something more ordinary exactly. than a garage sale. <laughs> yeah. So looking ahead, what's next in Romans? There's one more, one more in Romans, and then on yeah. to Advent. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've actually been biting my tongue most of this <laughs> sermon plus, um, but I, I think Lord willing, Sunday will kind of be a piggyback and something really helpful. We're going to talk about what it means to overcome sin, to fight sin in the spirit, um, where assurance actually comes from, and how we can kind of enter into that. We're going to talk about Mario Kart. Mm. Um, it's going to be, it's, Lord willing, it's going to be Should good Should we bring our switches if we have them? <laughs> it, it might land the illustration a little bit more. <laughs> hey. I don't have one, so someone bring one. Um, what about a brief word as to what Advent is? Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. What is Advent? Advent it starts mean, in, in two weeks. Yeah, it's a practice not actually in the Bible, mm-hmm. but 4th century, 300, 400 AD. Uh, and the church uh, adopted this kind of kind of ceremonial ritual of going through a period of again, disciplined expectation, like learning to long for the birth of the Savior, just like we see in so much of the Old Testament. Mm. And so it's a period of time where we anticipate, we kind of force ourselves to be like, oh, we're anticipating the coming of the Christ, which actually shouldn't force us because we should be anticipating the second coming, which right. is what Advent mm-hmm. is about. It's kind of like rehearsing that first coming as a means of training ourselves for the second coming. And so it's the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Um, and so uh, that's what Advent is. And there's usually various themes that you emphasize, uh, love, hope, joy, and peace. Um, although that was in the wrong order. Love is the last one. But um, yeah, so that's what it is. And it's a great time actually for families, at least in my practice with my family, it was always our kind of like most consistent times of spending time around the word and prayer happened during Advent. So I think it's a really good time to re-engage maybe if you've been drifting a little bit there as a family, like here's some good resources, here's some motivation and focus to kind of focus on Jesus uh, in a season that could be, you know, pretty hyper busy in other categories. And I will say over in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years we've done it, it has had that effect on our family. Like it's definitely been a stone of like, hey, this is the focus of the of Christmas, the Advent season, uh, is Christ. So it's been it's been great, and so we'll do that as a church, uh, not this Sunday, but starting the following Sunday. Hmm. So one more week of Romans, and then on to Advent. We'll have some resources available. We'll have some other. Uh, you, you heard on Sunday we have an Advent uh, service oh, on the wow. first as well. So. This is the last sermon on Romans for like two months. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>